Welcome to Mentoring Moments. Mentoring Moments is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast. It is composed of clips taken from Jason's one-to-one and group mentorship sessions. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. I have Sven Mucho joining me today as a guest mentor for Mentoring Moments. Welcome to the podcast, Sven. Thanks for having me, Jason. I'm super excited to have you here along for the ride today. We've been connected on LinkedIn, I now I think, for at least two years now, and I've been watching your growth, and I've been super intrigued by multiple things about your life. First of all, you're largely a digital nomad, like me and my wife uh, became digital nomads at the start of this year. I've kept up with kind of the personal amazing pictures, I think, the last photo I saw was in Peru. Um, you were on top of some mountain somewhere in Peru. I, I've seen a, a heck of a lot of amazing imagery that from the places that you've been visiting over the last year, year and a half. And then on the flip side, on the business side, I follow you because kind of I consider you my own personal TikTok guru because I don't, I don't, I, I don't really focus on TikTok. It's not a massive focus for me. Um, I've, I've definitely tried to be consistent with TikTok. It's much harder for me to be consistent with TikTok than it is just about any other platform. But I totally get and understand and appreciate and respect the opportunity of TikTok and the kind of work you're doing with your clients across TikTok marketing and the case studies that you're showing and the results that you're showing and snippets of ads that you're showing and everything else. It's pretty bloody inspiring and impressive. So I'm super excited about the conversation we're going to be able to have. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, you probably saw something from the mountains in Albania. I was just there for for three weeks and pretty much 95% of the time when I post pictures of traveling or go travel, it's some mountain, some crazy hike, some type of adventure I'm going on. I think you were in the middle of testing some climbing boots or something and you were like, uh, I can't remember whether you said they were amazing or whether they were crap. I think you said they were crap and I think, I think some, maybe they fell apart. I can't remember. Anyway, you were talking about the experience you had with these new boots that you had bought and uh and that was uh, or maybe they maybe they weren't waterproof i think you were saying or something like that I, I can't remember exactly but somehow you were telling the story about your boots and somehow you linked that back to business and i was like this is very clever <laughs> yeah sometimes i go a little bit overboard it's the typical linkedin influencer you know yeah I, I walked my dog today and then i thought about you know this kind of relates to business and sometimes <laughs> I, I put out a post like that i'm like is that really like related at all? <laughs> but I find that my most personal content, I don't know if, if, it, if it, you found the same thing, but I find my most personal and most vulnerable content uh, generally gets the most engagement by far, like, like by a country mile. So if I'm talking about somewhere I'm staying in Mexico or I, I capture a picture of a vista in the background or something like that, and sometimes... I don't say one word about business in those posts and I just simply say, oh, we're here and this is what we're doing. And hey, you know, I'd like to break up my feed and your feed too with, with something that's a little bit more personal. I find that those posts tend to do the very, very best. Basically, the more vulnerable I am and the less businessy I am, and I like to think most of my content isn't businessy in the sense that it's not salesy, but my personal posts t- tend to get the highest engagement. Yeah, absolutely the same for me. I mean, it makes sense since everyone can engage with it. When you have those business posts, it's just for a certain group of people and maybe other marketers engage, for me at least, or a few e com brand owners, those type of things. Um, but if you post about traveling, like everyone's a fan, your friends support it. And what I found for me is also I have a lot more people that would technically be my target audience. So we work with e-commerce brands, right? And every time I post a personal story, like, traveling or those type of things about how I went on the mountain, the beach or whatnot. Usually some of these people engage with it because they see all my content and that's how I know they see all my content. It's just when it's targeted about TikTok ads and maybe they're not ready for it, not running ads or just, you know, it's just businessy. So they prefer to engage with their other content. But it, for me, it always gives me a, a sign of, hey, people in your target audience are watching it. And when they comment on that stuff, I know they're also going to see more of my business stuff. So it goes hand in hand for me as a strategy, honestly. It's not, it's not by chance that I post those things. <laughs> and, and for me, um, I engage. Like if I look at it as a content consumer, 
I tend to like the more personal content. I tend to like the content with great imagery. I tend to like the stuff that I can actually re relate to as a human rather than just a business person or as an e-com consultant or whatever. I find that I like there's just the psychology that, you know, we have trained ourselves or we've been trained effectively to automatically filter out BS. We've been trained to filter out anything that seems or sounds or looks or smells like marketing. We've been trained automatically, you know, with the advent of the cell phone, like if I'm watching a TV program or something, which is almost always on a streaming platform, if there's an ad or something like that, for whatever reason, maybe it's a local streaming platform that's just, just OTA and uh, if it goes to ads, I immediately mute it and I just go on my cell phone until the ads are finished. And then I go back to, to watching what I was watching. And so the, the, the phone has truly become a second screen, even in scenarios where it's not the primary screen, it is the default second screen of our lives. And it's definitely the remote control of our lives for sure. And I, I feel like if I look at my own psychology, uh, I automatically tune out anything that remotely seems like an ad. And that's what I think this ties nicely into some of the work you're doing around TikTok, which is you're doing these fast cuts, you're doing fast jumps, you're doing really engaging stuff. And there's all these different styles that you've been, and what I like about you is you've been posting like when a specific TikTok piece of content doesn't have to necessarily be a paid ad, it could be an organic piece of content. When it pops off, you post it to LinkedIn and then you kind of break down why you believe that particular piece of content was successful. And, you know, I, I think that, that that sort of show and tell type of content is super powerful because instead of saying, we'll do this, and I, I'm a big fan of show, don't tell. And I think that's exactly what your content largely does. It's, hey, look at this piece of content we created. Watch it for yourself right here in the feed in LinkedIn. Then I'm going to break down why we created it, how we created it, what the results were, and why you believe the results were the, the way that they were. And to me, that's almost like a BTS. It's almost like a piece of behind the scenes content where we're getting a view into your world as a creator in an agency that you wouldn't normally get. You would normally only see the results in, in, in TikTok. You'd only see the piece of content in your feed in TikTok. But with you, what resonates for me is this, this feeling that we're yeah, we're, we're definitely getting a peek about how the secret sauce is made, right? And that's what resonates with me. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that also just show, but don't really tell, if you know what I mean. It's a lot of people in the creative space and our agencies popping up more that do UGC and all those type of things. And they just post videos, but it's not necessarily well-performing ones. So if I post a video that's been performing well, I always try to include the results so people know what it did. And when it didn't do well, let's say I'm about, I wanted to post one uh, this week if I get client approval that hasn't been run yet. And I just want to post it because it's a new format I really want to test. And then I would also want to make sure that it's, okay, hey, I'm super excited about testing this to make, you know, to make sure it's not something that where people think, okay, this made a million already. This has been like performing like crazy. I just want to make sure, you know, people don't get lured into that. Okay, I've seen this amazing ad on LinkedIn. That's a great idea. I should try that too. I actually never performed. Like the agency tested it. It didn't do stuff, but it just looks pretty. There, I've seen a lot of those ads out there with like no breakdown, no results, nothing. Just, hey, you have to test this ad format. And it's like no basis behind that, no results, nothing else. The one that leaps to mind immediately for me, and look, I've seen a lot of your amazing work, but the one that for some reason has stuck in my head is there was a beach scene where there was this amazing beach chair and it, it kind of looked like it was, it was almost like it was reversed from the point where it was erected to, to backwards into the camera, but it actually in the finished result, it almost looked like the chair was being thrown and then it exploded into place where it just landed perfectly ready for somebody to sit in. And I thought that that particular, you know, I know that that's a, that's a reasonably common style that we see for some things on TikTok, but that one really caught my attention because finding the right beach ch chair is an absolute bitch. And, uh, and uh, like, I'm very particular about, about my beach chairs and there's very, very few that I actually like that are compact enough, light enough, but yet have the right support and they're actually comfortable to sit in on the beach. And so when I saw that, I thought, man, I would, if I, if that just happened to fall into my feed on TikTok, 
I would probably watch that several times just because of the engaging style of the content. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, that ad has I've been crushing it. We just relaunched a public Friday, obviously. Um, we've been running it for like quite a while now. And it's just, we try to replicate it too, because the client, so for anyone who hasn't seen the ad yet, it's it's a bigger chair, like a backrest, uh, yet still pretty compact. And they also have one version of the chair, my client, where it's super compact, so not as much of the backrest and doesn't look like as much, like just by the looks of it. It's way more compact, so it's kind of like really cool. You can just stuff it in the side of your backpack, but it doesn't look as cool. And we tried to recreate the exact same ad with that chair. We threw it the same way. We did it on the beach. We showed pretty much the exact same scenes. And I think the hook rate on the one you're talking about was like almost 70%. And, you know, what was like through the roof, watch through it, I think 30% of people uh, finished the ad. Like not, not even people that got hooked and then finished, 30% of people who got the impression on their feet finished the video. And with the regular version of the chair, it was about, it wasn't performing at all. It was like 35, 40%. So, you know, it wasn't the hook itself, it was the chair in combination with the hook, just that the chair looked so appealing and amazing. So you, cause I tried the same hook with other products too, and they didn't perform the same. For some products that performed well, like the negative type of hook performs really well, but not nearly as well as that one. Like that's probably the best hook we've also had, I want to say ever maybe even. Like it's definitely up there just because the product, like the product fit is so good. with the Yes. Environment. And I guess to me, maybe what that signifies is that if you're going to work with an agency like yours, then they better have multiple playbooks that they can run and and hook types and imagery types and you know static versus dynamic moving content and you know so, so almost like almost like visual trickery type content and then you know there's 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 so many different formats that we see across TikTok that just crush that if the agency that you're working with kind of only has one go-to style then they're probably going to struggle if your your particular product doesn't work particularly well with that style of content. And so you need to have this kind of full spectrum playbook of content types and models. And well, first of all, you've got to have experience with enough product types and enough different um, you know verticals of product to where you can develop these playbooks for these different types of products. But then you also have to have the ability to execute on all those different, uh, and, and you really need more than one playbook for each product or category type because as you say it's so product dependent that you know not one style is going to work for every single product and category yeah that's the crazy part you literally have two chairs or three chairs from the same client they're slightly different and completely different formats work for them and i see that with a lot of you know a lot of meta agencies who now get into tiktok or who just want ugc for the meta ads because by the way, that ad, I think we spent even more on meta on it, and I don't know how much we spent, but if I had to guess, it's my, it's probably north of a million on just that ad by now, or versions of that ad. And a lot of these like old school agencies, I want to call them, that do a lot of media buying, and now they're like, okay, I actually need some UGC, I need some original video. They go with very basic hooks. I just did that recently. I, I used to have a PDF, like lead magnet, that had, I think, 60 or 70 hooks in it. And they all felt kind of basic to me at some point. Like, it was an older document, and I wasn't really proud of it anymore. And it's those, oh, TikTok made me buy the three reasons why, or attention if you're someone who, and then, you know, whatever audience you call out. And those are just so saturated and feel so basic. Um, I had to take my lead magnet down, to be honest. I just redid it and actually reduced it to 21 hooks and then just high quality stuff where it actually builds curiosity. Um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of mediocre UGC ads out there. A lot of people just doing the same stuff over and over again, trying the same format all the time, just making it sound a little different. Or, for example, resistant to trends. I've recently been running a lot of trends to be honest um i don't know if it 
just wasn't a thing before if i just found it now but with pretty much every client we've been testing at least three to five ads with just around 10 seconds and oftentimes if they have a clip it's in the in where where the chair is made or where the product is made and it just kind of shows the the product being made and stuff and like a bunch of the product it's all over the place or maybe in the warehouse and it just shows clips of all this different product and you know 10 seconds and after five seconds so there's text so the first five seconds there's not even text it's just sound because it's fast paced and people just watch it and after five seconds it's some kind of social proof thing like point of view we're packing fast, but you're buying faster. Or point of view, you have to pack 2,000 shares before the end of ship. Um, and that's definitely one of those situations where we had to adapt a lot. Like I did not know that worked, and I've tested those kind of trendy videos before, and they didn't do as well. And you know, that was in the details. So the key really was not showing it until five seconds in, because I also test the same video with having text up front but it feels too much like an ad. And also having that little social proof, because every time we put text with it that didn't have any social low-key social proof, it also didn't perform. So yeah, it's, it's always evolving. There's a lot of different things. You see one thing work with one client, and then I honestly just, if I see something popping off in one account, I just replicate it into all other accounts as quickly as possible, just to test it. Wow. And if we think about the types of buckets of content that we typically see on, on TikTok, oftentimes we're, we're seeing maybe the brands themselves create the, the content and, and just load it and manage it themselves. And they hope that they get lucky at some point with the algorithm. We get a situation where an agency like yours might create some of the content, but then grab some stock content from the brand that they integrate into the, into the, into the piece of content, or they might create that content completely from scratch themselves in-house. And then if we look at kind of the third, what I call bucket of content, we have maybe an agency like yours creates a brief for an influencer on TikTok. They go and create the, the, the content according to the brief because they're so good at being creative at scale because they're living and dying by their creativity on the platform. Then they not only post that content to their own feed, but then they give you the raw content that you can repurpose across you know, the business's feed, across other platforms like Meta, et cetera. And so what do you find typically works best in that environment and what type of creative are you typically creating in-house meaning do you take the brand's content and then repurpose it slice it dice it and make it into something flashy or are you typically doing running the entire creative process from scratch creating all of that content in-house from scratch yeah so it's a mix of both or even all three types of content so let's talk about a dream client like an ideal client that should be super easy to scale has everything in place there's some influencer content coming in, some viral videos that we can just run as ads. Those oftentimes perform really well. Um, not always. There's a lot of organic videos that have 50,000 views, 100,000 views that don't do better than ads. But oftentimes if a video has, let's say, 5 million views, it will do well. Um, so that's like the one bucket that usually comes from the client. Maybe in the future we'll integrate that too where we work with that, but right now we don't. Um, and then the other two types, obviously, where we created from scratch and repurpose from their stuff. So when we onboard a client, we can we usually do both. Most clients have some pre-existing assets already, some videos, some some clips. And what we do is one, we go out, we have in-house trained creators, so we give them our brief, like you said, a script, because we really want to test certain things. So we want to test certain types of hooks. I want to test. Okay, there's this negative kind of angle. Okay, I was, I had my doubts about this chair until I actually sat in it, like in the video you mentioned, versus, oh, this is the greatest chair I've ever found kind of angle, like social proof angle. Um, so we created a bunch of those with very new things that the client usually doesn't have, like specific clips, specific super creative things, like the throwing the chair, for example, which they oftentimes don't have, um, where they just have basic, like, showing the product footage and then after while we're doing that and the creator shoot the videos and such we also look at what does the client have already and what i found and i don't know how i lived without this tool be like i don't know how i survived without this tool i ran a business without this before but about i want to say a year ago ago 
I found Eleven Labs, which is a voice cloning, AI voice tool. Um, and their voice cloning is incredible. So with the right settings and stuff, and obviously my editors have done it a bunch. So they're great at it. I'm also good at it, but you know, they're better. Um, so we just managed, we buy the rights to voices. We reached out to creators like, hey, can we see a voice and stuff? And then pay them for it, which my assumption is those rates will be going through the roof in the future as well, because creators get more and more aware of how much we can do with those voices. Because we just go and we have six different male voices or whatnot. It's actually, I think, 10, 15 or, or something like that. And just look at the clips they have already. And we can script an entire ad. I send it to my editor. I script three different hooks, so we get three different versions as well. And then they just go and find the right clips our clients have. And yeah, just generate the voice based on that. And that way we can really scale. Because if you think about it, for me to generate 20 ads, so that's like, six to seven new ads with two to three hooks each, it'll take me, I'm not sure, like maybe an hour and a half or so to write those out with instructions and everything. So you can scale really far. And especially when you have that, when we get our net new content from creators, which is also important, you need new faces, new like genuine stuff from them, new clips and whatnot. Um, when we get clips from our creators in the beginning and then get even more clips to repurpose and always make sure to include specific things too. For example, with snoring clients, you might have seen videos on LinkedIn from, we wanted a paper plane clip because we wanted to make a joke where it's like this, this jet noise basically and the wife kind of moves the paper plane past the screen and shows the hus husband laying down there like a TikTok joke. Um, so we, we make sure to include those clips in our net new content. So we then have very specific hooks or visual clips for the repurposed content down the road. So yeah, that's kind of the, the process, like a mix of all three ideally, but it's always at least two. And do you usually play the role of creative director where you're kind of, you're planning strategically the, the account, you're planning what types of content you're going to create, you're planning any scripts, you're, you're planning whether you're going to engage, you know, uh, influencers or whether you're going to do this in-house with your own creatives, you know, how, I, I guess, who determines all of that? I mean, I guess from like, from the outside looking in, I would, I would assume that you're kind of, you engage with the client, you're the creative director you work with them to plan out what the next, I don't know, three to six months might look like on the account, what the strategic ideation looks like and what the goals are, then down into the tactical execution across those different bu buckets and styles. Um, and then obviously being able to have the freedom within the account to adjust on the fly to trends and, and having a little bit of creative leeway to adjust on the fly to trends. Um, you know, I'd love to understand a little bit more you know, and for the audience's perspective, if they're looking to work with somebody like you, so there's, it seems like, I don't know, in the last 12 months, there's a million new TikTok agencies that say we're TikTok experts. So it's, it's hard to differentiate when someone says they're a TikTok expert, right? But I've seen the results of your work. So I know that you actually are a TikTok expert. And if I was going to go out there and I was going to do a bunch of performance marketing on TikTok, I would just work with you because it would just be easy. It would be an easy yes for me because I've seen your work firsthand. But what role do you typically play as the agency founder and owner and, and the agency is named after you? What role do you typically play? Because you're, you're pr presumably you're not actually on the tools anymore. And now you're really just kind of guiding and directing everything. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat in between. And by the way, we also have an official TikTok case study now. We were featured by TikTok. So we got that social proof there compared to all those other agencies that are popping up. Um, so I'm in, be, in between, like I'm not fully out of accounts, out of clients and those type of things. It's not like I have a big agency with 50 employees where, you know, you get on a call with someone and then someone completely different works with you. I do the sales calls. I, if you want to work with us, you'll be talking to me on the call. I will be doing the reporting. Um, I kind of plan the big picture thing for each client. So I be kind of directing like, hey, here's the ideas I would want to have. Here's some hooks I've seen work. So I do a lot of research in a day, a lot of like what can work, like on a weekly basis, what new things could we try, like those trends and such. Um, a lot of just looking at accounts where 
there might be some opportunity. And then sometimes also do some of the scripting still. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like my role. I'd say it's like the creative director also hands on. And yeah, I think that's how I describe it. And how useful do you think it is for brands to look at some of the super successful corporate accounts that seem to be able to consistently crush it on TikTok? I'm thinking of Bose. I'm thinking of one of those European airlines. I'm thinking of Samsung. I'm thinking of some of these. Uh, there's, there's a few big, very large brands that just seem to nail TikTok. And, and oftentimes, the, the biggest brands I'm seeing nail it there are the brands that would be what I would assume would be the least likely to crush it on TikTok because there's there are these big corporate monoliths and you would think that they would have so much corporate governance over, over almost freestyle content like that, that they would just never make it out of the lab, so to speak. It would never be allowed. You, you wouldn't think that it would be allowed because they're these big lumbering corporates. I mean, I just wouldn't assume that a Korean company like Samsung could be so creative and maybe they're not that creative. Maybe the agencies that they work with are just super creative and maybe they've been given a blank sheet or a blanket air cover from Samsung to say, no, TikTok is the one channel where we can kind of go nuts and not everything has to go through corporate or not everything has to go through legal or maybe you know it doesn't have to go through compliance or whatever it might be. Okay, here's, here's three rules thou shalt not break. But other than that, go ham, go wild. Uh, you know, so, so what do you think it takes for these particularly larger, more monolithic, more traditional brands. How do you think these brands are finding such massive success on TikTok without running afoul of, of the big corporate monolith? Yeah, I think it's kind of what you just said, where they basically get a blank sheet and then they're, they're told, okay, don't cuss on our TikTok, don't <laughs> like, yeah, the two No nudity. <laughs> yeah, no nudity. Don't shit on any competitors and such. And outside of that, they get complete freedom. I think that's the way to go for bigger corporations. Um, I think that's where they can work. I personally don't look too much at their content for inspiration, mostly because I think if you see Adidas or Ryanair, like you said, the European airline, if you see those names on your For You page, I'm, in my opinion, you're more likely to stop scrolling just because it's Adidas. If it was some new shoe brand, you wouldn't stop scrolling for the same video. It wouldn't have a million likes. It's just because it's a new Adidas shoe, and that's why it gets 500 million views or whatever. Um, so for inspiration, I like small accounts. I follow a lot of entrepreneurs, actually, that have their own brands. My favorite one, shout out to Iris Jade. Um, she's really big on Instagram. I actually don't know if she... I suppose she also posts on TikTok, but I'm not 100% sure right now. And it's more the mechanics behind it. It's not e-commerce, but a lot of her hooks I can use for products, for ads. It's just, you watch her videos and they all do, like some obviously go do really well, others do well, some do good, but she never has a video where I'm like, okay, no, I would never watch that. They all have great hooks, like they all have that story. And I remember the first time I watched her content, it was kind of like a light bulb moment where I looked at it and I was like, okay, this is actually mind blowing. Like this creates so much curiosity. And ever since I've been seeing her content, I'm very focused to focus on, okay, how can I make people think what's next? Like what's gonna happen? That type of thing, like the curiosity, everybody wants to stop the scroll, but you actually need to leave like a, what do you call it? Like an open loop that you close throughout the ad, basically. We kind of start with something, and then I think one ad, uh, one hook she used lately was, uh, I did not expect this to happen at Colts. I saved a man's life. And then you're like, okay, how did she, at Colts, saved a man's life? Like, what happened? You know, it's that you immediately, you know you're going to watch the rest of the ad, or at least a lot of it. And her product is sunscreen, so, you know, in the end, it's like, Oh, skin cancer, yada, yada. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of smaller creators. I'm trying to find more creators like her that are consistently that good. Um, with big brands, I'm not the biggest fan because I think the name makes up a lot. If they're successful, I think they need to have freedom because I worked with a really big brand before 
like in that realm of I don't, I don't know not adidas but like ryan like really big almost billion dollar company and it was horrendous to work with because they wanted to review every single one of my scripts they wanted to change like basically imagine an and they wanted to change that into an or those type of things um like really small things like small wording things so i'm like okay let's just test it let's just put volume out there and stuff out there for ads and yeah so for a big corporation let's say that you need to have that freedom like I, for me it's a red flag if someone wants to review every single of my scripts clients have access to our scripts they can they they're bored enough to look at all the scripts we put out they can do that but if they consistently say hey this change this change this change i'm like yeah then you might be better off doing it yourself because at that point you're also putting a lot of time in it and one of the accounts that i follow that i was absolutely blown away by again smaller creator um you you've i'm sure you've heard of her but like if you can imagine a topic more boring than excel formulas then like you're, you're doing better than me because i imagine that to be one of the most boring pieces of content ever and yet miss excel on tiktok has spun that into a multi hundred thousand dollar a month business selling her Excel courses, her digital courses, because her content is so creative and it takes what would traditionally be pretty, pretty much the most boring content you can possibly imagine with the most boring topics around it that you can possibly imagine. She's managed them to make them super fun, super engaging, super accessible to even people that don't think they could ever learn how to use Excel. And she's made it seem easy and fast using her program to learn how to leverage Excel. And her content is super, uh, like it's, it's just fun. It's super fun. You know, I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I don't have a huge reason to use Excel, but whenever I see a piece of her content in my feed, I always stop to watch the whole thing because it's fun. And it's, 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 again, you're talking about a topic that would typically be very dry, very boring, and she's managed to elevate it to a whole new level because she's just that creative. And I just think that it feels like the difference between – so on a scale of 10, it feels like to make the jump from a level 8 – creativity to a level of 10 creativity. It feels like it's not just a linear curve. It feels like it's more of a hockey stick in terms of the creative requirements, the creative juices. It feels like, you know, almost anyone can learn how to conquer TikTok on a level one to five scale of creativity, but to take your content from a level of five to 10 feels almost impossible. You like, you've got to be an insane outlier to, to eke that extra few percent at the top that translates, that can be the definer of success or failure on the platform. It feels like those real top creators, they make it seem so easy, but it's because they're so naturally creative. That's how it feels to me anyway, as an outsider. Yeah. I mean, I think naturally, to some extent, they have the camera presence. Like with the X example, maybe not as much because I haven't seen one of the videos in a while, but I know who you're talking about. And I think she mentions a lot of like basically the outcome, the results people desire. So in her case, it's very much focused on what do people really want to learn? And a lot of people try that stuff and, then, uh, and they make a video like three reason, three ways you can upgrade your Excel, uh, your Excel game. And nobody really cares because why would you and I care about Excel, how to upgrade our Excel game? And what she does differently, for example, is just giving people a reason to stay. She shows them, hey, here's why you need that and why you need to stay. Even like you said, you don't need it. It'll still make you watch it. And I think the results for like level one to seven or one to eight creators are all relatively the same. I think like level seven or eight may sometime occasionally by luck hit a viral video. And that level nine or 10, especially that level 10, that's just consistent every video, you know it's going to do well. And I've also seen a lot of, I've watched a lot of YouTube videos on this too, where some, some people made YouTube channels to prove that it's not luck. And immediately their first video got 20,000 views and they promoted it in creative ways. Sometimes it also just popped off. So a mix of both. And with those videos, you can really see, okay, there's a science behind this. Like you can, you realize, recognize once you know how to do it, like once I kind of had this light bulb moments with ads. Now, every time I see a YouTube short, for example, I can exactly tell why it does well, because it's always 
it's not always the same, obviously, but it always has the same feeling to it. Like it always has the same elements. And it's always like this, oh, hook, like kind of more curiosity, you know, you know, why you should watch kind of, why should you care? And then goes into the storytelling and the big reveal towards the end. Um, like objects, for example, I remember one, one video was about um, this streamer is making millions and it's all because of this door. And then, you know, it talks about some stuff like how great Twitch is the biggest streaming platform and YouTube is also the biggest. So like just giving some education background, maybe people watch more. And then towards the end, he's like, yeah, and this door is like a sitcom door. People come, come through, come in. So it invests people like a sitcom. And the structure of it is just, you know, the hook super interesting. Then kind of body where it's like, okay, yeah, Twitch, multi-million dollars, he makes millions and this kind of stuff. And then the big review at the end. And a lot of stuff is the same, like TikTok organic, TikTok ads, meta ads, When if you do video UGC like we do. Um, obviously, they're slightly different, like each platform and or each client and ad, but lots, lots of the ads and successful ads and shorts and TikToks, organic videos and stuff, they, you can tell once, once you've cracked the science, you can just keep replicating it. Most people just never crack the science behind it because you post for a year. I did that myself. I post, I'm not posting on TikTok right now. I haven't posted in a while. Um, same reason as you. I found it personally, I'm not that great on camera when it comes to TikTok. And I found it too draining, like looking at 500 different ads basically a day and doing my own TikTok kind of drives me nuts. Um, probably pick it back up like this podcast I probably will purpose too for short form. But yeah, like once, once you crack it, basically you can just keep cracking it over and over again. Different clients, different industries, all kind of the same. There's some nuances to it like between e-commerce and B2B. But in the end, they all they're all the same, really, all the same principles, just different hooks and such. And people just sat down like for one week straight and just tried to actually study good creators instead of studying the three ways to use Excel videos, then they'd also be doing much better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I guess I would, you know, from a commercial perspective, and, and maybe we can talk about your commercial commercial model a little bit. Um, you know, you don't have to give, give me specifics, but you know, it seems like there are different approaches that agencies take in this space. Where maybe they'll say, "Okay, we're gonna our fees are gonna be based on a percentage of ad spend or ad you know ad yeah basically the ad budget. We're gonna take a percentage of that uh, for us, or we're gonna charge you a, a fixed fee per month to put out X amount of creative, or we're gonna charge you a flat fee." Um, in addition to a per output, a per creative output fee, like as an incremental fee on top of that. So you'll, you'll, you'll pay a flat fee to have an account manager, basically and a strategist, and then anything from there you, you pay extra for. Then there's some that seem like they're going the route of saying, hey, we've cracked the code, so we know that we can guarantee a certain number of views per video, maybe even a certain number of conversions, or at least a certain number of website visits from there. So we're going to charge you based on, we're going to charge you, no, there's no fixed fee. It's based on the number of, of views that we can generate for you um, based on your budget of spend. And then from there, we're, we're, it's almost like a rev share of the performance that we drive for you. So it feels like there's a number of different ways that, that agencies like yours engage with the market. What do you think is the best engagement model and, and why? Because for me, if I, if, I, if I could say, well, look, if you agree that I'm an interesting enough person or I have an interesting enough story or I have an interesting enough service or product or whatever it is for you to take me on as a client, then wouldn't it be in both of our best interests for you to just charge on a per impression or per view basis? And then it's like literally my success equals your success or is your thinking, well, there's too many variables outside of our control that would potentially limit viewership of an ad or of an organic piece of content. So therefore we have to be at least minimally compensated for our efforts, regardless of how it ultimately performs because so much of that is out of our hands. I mean, how do you start thinking about the commercial model of this game? Because I know how it works in, in, in the agency, the typical agency world, like the e-com agency world where you're doing development and perhaps some side marketing services in addition. 
But this whole space, even as it relates to engaging influencers, how you work out what they should be paid, what the engagement model is, et cetera, it's all, it all feels, because this isn't my world, this feels like a complete black box to me. Yeah. So for me, regardless of the pricing model, I think if you don't deliver 10x value, like any pricing model is flawed. And that's the case with a lot of agencies. So if you charge 10K and you don't deliver value for 100K, then, you know, shouldn't be higher, to be honest. Um, so in terms of what pricing model, the pr I started when I, when I earlier as a freelancer started with it, I tried the performance-based one with a minimum. So I think my first ever pricing was something like $700 a month or 10% of revenue. Um, now that I'm, you know, much further in, no much more, um, there's the purely revenue model for me is, is an issue because you can't really track it. For example, are you going by triple rate? Are you going by bad manager? Are you going by um, post-purchase survey? It's really just hard to track the revenue from a single channel. So you could probably break it down in a way so it's fair for you as an agency. Um, Problem for me is I think you always need to charge a minimum some way. That's how I do it. So I charge minimum or percentage of ad spend, whichever one is higher. So that gives me a minimum, but also performance based for clients. I think the problem with only profit based is you don't really have the funds to deliver high quality services. If I don't get paid, you know, onboarding and such takes time. So if I don't get paid until six weeks in and I have a team to pay, I have you know, I need to eat and all those type of things. I think it's very much survival mode where you can't really focus on, you know, giving high quality advice, high quality services. Um, so what I did instead is for us, we include all the repurposing in our retainer in our minimum slash 10% of ad spend. Um, Cause I know for some agencies I had a client once and they were like, oh yeah, but our old Facebook agency charges 6% of ad spend. Like, yeah, but how much content do they repurpose? Do they put out the content at scale like we do with AI scripts and like new creators and all that. Um, so that's for us included in the fee. And we also include growth support in that. So conversion rate optimization uh, support. We recently, so one of our clients, for example, we meet weekly, we kind of go over paid performance. Then we spend a good 20 minutes on, okay, what test shall we run next on the landing page? And we've been doing that for two months now, I think. And the last have really kind of cracked it. And I think we increased our conversion rate by 14% since we started working on it. And they were converting right already. I think we were converting at 4.5% to start with and then added another 0.5, now on top of that to an already good landing page. Um, you can imagine that's, they made, I think they make around seven, eight hundred thousand a month in revenue, maybe, maybe a million even. So that's somewhere between ninety thousand to hundred ten thousand monthly revenue they would get for the next, you know, until something changes to human behavior. So probably for at least the next five or ten years. So that way, you know, no matter what I charge, I don't charge on the thousand. So I pretty much ten times the value already just do that and then ads are basically kind of like a nice bonus on top of it if you look at it that way right um so that that's our recharge like we include all that to make sure we have like a value load um obviously like the advice we don't develop the landing pages or do stuff on them if they need a dev which usually our clients have a dev since it's semi figure e-commerce businesses we have a partner agency that can implement it but we kind of guide them through which is more than enough for them, you know, if they make a small headline change, I've seen that increase it by 5%. So that's a refund load there. And then with creators, if we need net new contents, so anything completely new from our creators, they get paid per video and such, then we just have a flat fee per net new video on top of that. And that's really very by, okay, how much content does the client have already? How much are we spending? How much com net new stuff do we need versus how much can we repurpose? Um, for that one, it's very much, it really depends when people ask, okay, how much are we going to 
spent on that new stuff. It depends. If you give me hundred, uh, if you give me two hundred videos already, I can repurpose a lot. Especially if there's good videos in there. If you give me two videos, there'll probably be a lot more we have to spend on that new stuff. So makes makes complete sense. And we're coming down to the end of our time together. But if you had to give, let's say some, you know, let's say it's an e-commerce brand and they're doing, I don't know. Let's say they're doing $10 million a year in revenue at, at the moment. You know, they're not doing TikTok, or if they're doing it, they're doing it very badly today. And apart from hiring somebody like you, if, if, if you were kind of giving them pointers and advice of how to level up their TikTok game, I realize this is very broad and it's not even category specific or product specific, but just generally, how do you think about the steps to setting up a brand? for TikTok success? Would it be, hey, look, I would recommend before you engage a guy like me, maybe for example, I would recommend you go out and you create 20 long form videos covering these things that we then can repurpose in different ways. You know, what types of things are you advising brands to do to set themselves up for success on TikTok for the long term? Yeah, so for me, the number one thing is not them doing anything on the content side and such. For me, it's making sure landing page is great. I, I mean, I'm obviously big on ads. I talk a lot about, about creative, but I still think if you want to make an improvement with pretty much low effort or you know not a lot of changes, then just improve the landing page. It's easier to get another ten percent increase there compared to your ads. Um, other than that, I'd also say. It all starts with TikTok. So really people people are hesitant to jump on TikTok or that type of content. But really once you've cracked up a TikTok or once you that type of content crack that type of content, it unlocks a lot more performance on meta, meta ads or Instagram reels or Facebook reels. Um, so I think yeah, I guess my advice would be focus on landing pages first, always. Um, get post purchases surveys up. I find a lot of agencies or brands use those for attribution, but they don't ask the right questions about creatives. I look a lot of at the other sections, ask specific questions to not just find their pain points, because really every brand has those information after one week of running post purchase surveys. More questions where you can look at the other section where people customize the answer and then get really good creative angles from that. Our snoring client, a lot of people said something small like heard about us, Joe Rogan in the other section, which we're not partnered with Joe Rogan or anything. But he talks in his podcast at some point about snoring and this mouthpiece and stuff. So we made ads around that. A lot of people mentioned their doctor, for example. That's just an example, like at the basic level of how did he hear about us, how you can turn that into content. Said doctor. Once we uh, implemented, okay, a doctor rec my doctor recommended this into the content, which is legit because a lot of doctors do already. You got to stay, you know, ethical with it. Um, also, like conversion rate increased like crazy. So yeah, I'd say landing page, post purchase survey, get the beyond just basic. How did you hear about us? Questions, and think about if you if you start with TikTok, it's kind of going to spread to the success is going to spread to Meta, Instagram, Facebook. Potentially YouTube Shorts. I haven't. I don't run Google, and the clients where they take our TikToks. I honestly don't know the exact results. I just know the overall Google Ads results from them. Um, yeah, I think that that would be my advice if that makes sense. Absolutely amazing. Love it. This is uh, this has been an enlightening conversation for me, who knows virtually nothing about success on TikTok and have a very small account. So I appreciate your insights now. I, I normally do this on the B2B and, and, and SaaS episodes, but I'd love for you to ask me one question, any question you like, can be personal or professional. So I'd love to hand the microphone over to Sven Mucho. And uh, what's your question for me today, man? Yeah, I think I'd actually ask something B2B related. I was listening to the podcast today, kind of catching up on $100 million leads by Alex Amosi and stuff. Can't hurt to know about that stuff. What do you find the most effective way to have a lead magnet that one gets actually consumed and two 
you know, actually converts into clients instead of just useless downloads or email uh, emails added to your list. So basically, like what format or what, like anything around it really, the delivery of it, is it video, is it a PDF, is it, you know, like how is it packaged? Is, is it like a case study that you put behind an email? Is it like a, you know, something else? I think for me, so I don't have any formal lead magnet. I don't have like one of those funnelytics things. I don't, I don't run like a formal funnelized process. That's not, that's not kind of how I run my content, but there's, there's probably two things that really stand out for me is that the sheer scale and volume that you have of content in the market that links back to you in some way, at least by name, even if it's not directly linked to your LinkedIn or to your Reddit or to your, you know, to your, to your YouTube or whatever it is, or even to your website. I feel like as, you know, cause I've been a pretty hardcore creator for a few years now. And, you know, I really only started taking my podcast seriously two years ago and putting that out at scale. And I'm to almost, uh, almost up to 300 episodes. Now I originally started out with one episode a week. Then I went to two episodes a week. And now I'm at three episodes a week, which are all on different topics. And I also only about six months ago from memory started doing a video version of the podcast, not just audio. And so I have much bigger representation now in YouTube than I used to have before. And when I look at this cumulatively and all the places that I'm now redistributing and re repack repackaging, repurposing and distributing my content now, when I Google just my name, I, I kind of dominate, even though there's many Jason Greenwoods in the world, just if you Google my name, I'm kind of like, I just absolutely dominate that the first 10 results. I think like seven or eight out of the first results, uh, first top 10 results are, are, are me and my pages, whether it's, you know, uh, in, in Apple podcasts or whether it's my website or whatever it is, my bio page, like my bio page on my website gets insane amounts of traffic just because people might be looking for my name and Googling my name. So that's the first thing. I think the sheer volume that you can, it, it, it it's gotta be quality of course, but I think, especially when you're first starting out the fire hose or the impact of the fire hose of output of content, it counts for a lot because what people consider quality content is pretty subjective anyway. So you think you can put, you're putting out the most bomb ass content you can, and it could absolutely fall on its face. Then you can put out a piece of content that you think, well, that's bloody average. And then that one just goes viral for some reason. And you don't even necessarily know why. Yes, there's some certain formulas that you can follow, but I very rarely can predict exactly which piece of my content will just go nuts. So I think, I think volume matters. And if you cannot put out at least your pillar content, for me, my pillar content is my podcast content because everything kind of drops out of that. Um, if you can't find a way to do that at scale, you're going to really struggle. That's the first thing I would say. Then secondarily, actual testimonials from real customers with no BS that you can make lo relatively long form, i.e. five to 10 minute video testimonials. So I think testimonials on websites, nine times out of 10, they're, they're made up BS, at least in the services industry that I play in, not so much in the e-commerce space because UGC is much easier to gather in the e-commerce space. But in the services space, I take every single testimonial on a services-based website for Absolute. I just assume it's it's BS and it's made up by the brand. Uh, but when I see a video testimonial, like I only feature video testimonials on my website, so people can see this is legit, right? And that when I when I was finally at enough scale to be able to start loading those, because you got to finish a project with a customer before you can create a testimonial video, and then you've got to edit it, and then you've got to get it uploaded. So it takes a little bit of time to have enough traction and enough completed projects to be able to go and get those vi uh, video testimonials. But I tell you, they are game changers in terms of conversion, because if you can repurpose those across social and you can repurpose those across your website and you can really point back to genuine success with the people you work with, I just find there's no substitute for that. There's just you just can't get that same level of engagement any other way. And people, especially when I work with someone in the services industry, as you know, they the number one thing they are thinking to themselves in their mind is, will I get a good result with this provider. They don't, they don't even really care too much about the money. There are always the price sensitive ones out there. And I don't really ever work with price sensitive customers because my pricing isn't targeted at price sensitive customers. But 
they do want to have some level of a guarantee around results. Even if it's not in writing, they want to have a super high level of confidence that they're going to get results. And if you can prove that through video testimonials that like it's impossible, give it another five years, maybe you'll be able to completely BS those as well because AI will be able to create those from scratch. But as of right now, video at that quality is almost imp impossible to spoof. And so therefore it's considered what I, what I consider to be from a testimonial perspective, there is no more valuable testimonial than a video testimonial. Yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's definitely something I personally need to work on. I have my, our uh, TikTok feature has been quite strong now because obviously it's kind of hard to fake that too. But yeah, I agree, video. I think also I was thinking a lot about example wanted to do a webinar kind of walk through case study mix. But basically like, hey, here's how we did client X, like landing page section. And then, you know, something like that as in lead magnet form, basically just kind of record it and then use it as lead magnet. I think might also be really strong, but we'll see. I don't know yet. Yeah, well, it's, it's all about test and learn, it, it, you know, and the trends are always changing. And I think you have to take advantage of new opportunities when they come along. You have to be a little bit opportunistic in terms of new channels, staking your flag in the ground, start testing early, grab those anchor profile names, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just all that new stuff. I think when new channels come along that, that have a good chance of popping off, planting your flag in the ground early, I think is super important uh, before the platform gets noisy because uh, I'm seeing LinkedIn get super noisy now. TikTok's become super no noisy, so it's harder to get cut through on those platforms than ever before. And that always happens with every platform. Every platform becomes noisy. Every platform gets ruined by marketers eventually. So trying to get there early is always very important to sort of stake your claim on your territory in, within that platform. But uh, Sven, if people want to get a hold of you, how do they find you? Are they best to reach out to you on LinkedIn initially. I'll, of course, in the in the show notes here, I'll put a link to your uh, to your LinkedIn page and to your and to your agency page, etc. But how do you like people to reach out to you? Yes, yeah, so it's uh, usually either via via website if they want to schedule a call, which is muchomarketing.com, m u c h o w, and then just marketing.com, or just in general LinkedIn if they have any questions, if they just want to. Tag along for the ride, learn about TikTok ads, UGC, just meta, or just, you know, sometimes see some cool travel pictures and such, learn about like the nomad life. Uh, LinkedIn is the best place. Also, obviously, I have, a, have links to all my resources, my free learning resources there, any like checklists for landing pages, like step by step walkthroughs, how we scale clients, all those are on LinkedIn. Wow. Absolutely amazing. Sven, I so appreciate your time today. Thank you for being the guest mentor of the day on the e-commerce edge podcast. It's always, always nice to catch up with you, my friend, and I wish you all the best and uh, hope to have you on again soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me.